Okay, this video is on the inverse variation function. And the inverse variation parent function is written y equals 1 over x. And the graph of the inverse variation function looks like this. And you'll notice it's kind of made up of these two separate curvy pieces. All right, It's a function that, even though it's just a single function, it's actually made up of two separate parts that don't touch. And this actually is going to, as we're going to see, this has some effect on the domain and the range and the asymptotes and the intercepts of the function. So one of the things that is uh, kind of interesting about the inverse variation function is that these curvy parts here, they get very, very, very close to, for example, right here, this part of the graph gets very, very close to the x-axis, but it never touches the x-axis. And over here, as it goes up, as x keeps getting closer and closer to zero, you see the graph goes up and up and up, and it keeps getting closer and closer to the y-axis, but it never actually touches the y-axis. So what that means for the domain, the domain, remember, is all of the x values that a function can have. Well, I can see I've got all of these positive x values here. That's where the curve, uh, the part of the graph here has positive x values. And I got a bunch of negative x values over here, but since my graph never actually touches the y-axis, well, I can't have x be equal to zero. And in fact, you can probably see why it is that I can't have x equal to zero here in the algebraic part of the function. So the domain then for the inverse variation function is, we usually write it like this, x is equal to all real numbers except for zero. So x can be any real number, positive number, negative number, but it can't be equal to zero. The range, I can remember the range is the y values. And again, I've got positive y values up here. Here's a bunch of positive y values. I've got negative y values down here, and yet my graph never actually touches the x-axis, that's where y would be equal to zero. So again, my range is very much like the domain. It can be any positive y value, it can be any negative y value, but y can never be equal to zero. So we usually write that as the range is y equals all real numbers except for zero. And now this turns out to help us identify what we call the asymptotes. And an asymptote is just a line that a graph gets closer and closer and closer and closer to, but it never actually touches that line. And you can see for this graph, the graph of the inverse variation function, we actually have two asymptotes. One of our asymptotes is the x-axis, because here I can see the graph getting closer to the x-axis, but it never touches. And the other one is the y-axis. So there's actually a couple of ways to write the asymptotes for this function, and we're going to write it both ways. So one of our asymptotes, the x-axis, we could just say the x-axis. And we're also going to write it like this, or the line y equals 0. So the line y equals 0, that's another way of expressing the x-axis. Right. The other asymptote is the y-axis. And another way of expressing the y-axis is it's the line where x equals 0. So we can say or the line x equals 0. Now intercepts, since the graph never touches either the x-axis or the y-axis, well that means I don't have any intercepts. I don't have any x-intercepts and I don't have any y-intercepts. Now, the inverse variation function is often written in the form y equals k over x, where k, a number, is never zero, and x, which is the independent variable, is also never zero. k is called the constant of variation 
And as the value of x increases, that is, as the independent variable x increases, the value of y decreases. And you can kind of see this if you look at the graph here. If you look at, say, just this part of the graph, as x increases, as x gets larger and larger and larger, well, the value of y, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So as x increases, y decreases. Okay, transformations. Again, this should start looking very familiar to you. You've seen these same transformations, and they work the same way on the inverse variation function as they do on the other functions that we've looked at. So this negative value here, that causes a vertical reflection. The a value, or sometimes called the k value, that value causes a vertical stretch. if A is greater than zero, excuse me, if A is greater than one, or it causes a vertical compression if A is greater than zero and less than one. That is, if it's a fractional value between zero and one. C. This translates the graph left or right. And D, this translates the graph up or down. Now, notice that when we translate left or right, the asymptote of the function also translates left or right. And Depending on how much we translate left or right, that's going to tell us what the new line is for the asymptote. So for example, this line, the uh, translation left or right, the amount that we translate left or right, that tells us that the vertical asymptote is going to be, I'll write it like this, the vertical asymptote is the line x equals C. So this value right here becomes the new vertical asymptote. And if we translate up or down, well then the horizontal asymptote that becomes the line Y equals D. And we're going to see some examples of this in just a minute. Okay, so let's take a look here at example one. I've got a, I can see I have a parent function, that's my inverse variation function, that is if I take away all of my transformations, I'm left with y equals one over x. So in this case, my transformations are just, I'm going to move, let's see, that would be right three units. So I'm gonna to move to the right three. And I'm gonna be moving up four. All right. So when I'm graphing inverse variation functions, typically I like to draw in my asymptotes first because once I know where my asymptotes are, then it's easier to draw in the two curvy pieces of my graph. So I'm going to draw my asymptotes here in green just so it makes them easier to see. So if I move right three and up four, then that means right three, one, two, three, then my vertical asymptote is going to move three units to the right also. And if I move up four, well, my horizontal asymptote is also going to move up four. So one, two, three, four. And now I've got my vertical asymptote and my horizontal asymptote. And since that's the only transformations I have, well, now I can draw in the two curvy parts of my inverse variation graph. It's going to look like that. 
All right, example number two. Now, this one, I've actually tried to, to draw my, I've drawn in my parent function, and I've also tried to kind of sketch in uh, the, the function a little bit more accurately here so I can show you this additional thing that you want to do when you are graphing and you have a a value or a k value that's different from one. Because what happens, as we're going to see, is that when we do a vertical stretch in this case, what that means is that this point right here, what are called the corner points, those corner points are going to change. All right. So let's take a look at what our transformations are going to be here. So I've got a negative value here, so I know I'm going to have a vertical reflection. And I've got a value of, my A value is greater than 1, so I'm going to have a vertical stretch. And then I've got a plus 1 here, so let's see, that's going to move me left 1 unit. Okay, so if I have a vertical reflection, then that's going to take this and flip it vertically. So this piece is going to come down here and this piece is going to come up here. All right. So this one's basically going to go from the first quadrant to the fourth quadrant. And this is going to go from the third quadrant to the second quadrant. And I'm going to be moving to the left one unit, which means my asymptote, my vertical asymptote, is going to move to the left one unit. And so now I just want to figure out what I'm going to do about my vertical stretch. Okay, well, ordinarily, the corner points right here, you notice that they're exactly one unit away from my original asymptote and one unit away from this original asymptote. One unit here, one unit here. Well, the thing that determines how far away the corner points are from the asymptotes is this value k. And in particular, it's the square root of that value. So in this case, I have a k value that's equal to 4. And the square root of k, then, is going to be the square root of 4, which is 2. So that means while ordinarily I would, let's see, this is a reflected function. So ordinarily, my corner points would be right here and right here, because that is one unit away from my horizontal asymptote and one unit away from my vertical asymptote on both sides. Since my k value is 4, and since the square root of 4 is equal to 2, my actual corner point is going to be right here and right here. That is, it's going to be two units away from my horizontal asymptote and two units away from my vertical asymptote. This one is two units away. Did I move that one over too much? I think I moved that one over too much. This one is going to be two units away from this asymptote. Yeah, it should be right here. So it's two units away from my vertical asymptote and two units away from my horizontal asymptote. Now I can draw in these curvy parts. There is the graph of my transformed function.